Okay. Don't click on guest. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually that, that like, I know. I accidentally did that the last time I ran the stream because I I accidentally double clicked it and it hit in, in broadcast. And yeah. You can't get it. That. You can't get it back. Yeah. You can't, no back like, stream. It's done. Yeah. No back <sighs> All right. Did I show you the video that my uh, C star got of the eclipse? Yeah, you put it in Slack. Oh, that's right. I did. I cannot believe it turned out that good. It's so good. shows uh, public astronomy talks taking place in bars and breweries around the world. So if you're visiting from somewhere else, check, you might check out the website astronomyontop.org. There might be a show near you. Tonight we have two exciting speakers and uh, we, we also have the return of everyone's favorite astronomy in the news. Some events might have recently happened in astronomy that are astronomy related. <laughs> Last week, I think. We'll see. We'll learn about it. Uh, during each talk, there will be a trivia question or two or three. Uh, if you have, think you have an answer, go ahead and raise your hand. And uh, if you get the answer correct, you're entitled to receive a prize over at the merch table during intermission or after the show ends. So if you win the prize, be sure to identify yourself at the table and uh, we can get a sticker. Um, oh, my name is Logan Pierce. Uh, I'm a graduate student here at the University of Arizona in astronomy. Um, and uh, let's see, what else? Oh, we are right next to an active train line. So it will definitely happen during the show that a train will probably interrupt our speakers. And when that happens, what do we do? We raise our glass and we toast the train and we say choo-choo, and then we wait for a minute until it quiets down enough to hear again. Um, uh, we, um, as previously alluded to, we have a merch table over here with a ton of really great, cool, fun Space Drafts merch. We have pint glasses and stickers and magnets and posters and a lot of other stuff. I'm, that's all I got for now. It's really great. Come, uh, come check it out. Uh, there's also a tip jar if you're feeling tipsy. Um, and so we will start with one speaker, then we will have a 20 minute intermission, followed by astronomy in the news, and then our uh, final speaker. So without further ado, I would like to invite up our first speaker, Arvind Gupta, from, who is a postdoctoral researcher at Noir Lab here in Tucson, Arizona. Please give a round of applause. Uh, I'm also not able to advance my slides. Hold on. Hang on. Okay, try it now. <laughs> Every time. No, all the volume knobs are turning all the way up. I don't understand. Okay, try it again. 
Well. Oh, we don't have the dongle plugged in. Oh, that's why. Ha! Is it in here still? One minute. Yeah. <laughs> it's not space traps without snafus. Yeah, and now put PowerPoint in the forefront. Yep. Okay. Try it out. <laughs> oh, it's it's advancing. There's a light lighting up here. It's advancing there, but not on the screen. Just can you just put? Okay, try it now. See, it's scrolling here. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Maybe you can just advance it for him. Whoa. Well, you, because you clicked it. Uh oh. There we go. That? Yeah. All right. All right, it's going. Cool. Oh, so, in case anybody has forgotten the last couple minutes, my name is Arvind Gupta. <laughs> um, so, we'll start here. Yeah, with a, a quick solar system 101. So on this diagram here, the distances are not to scale, but all the sizes are. So I'm showing all the planets in the solar system, and they are in the right order um, from the sun. So Mercury is the closest, Neptune is the farthest away. Um, and something that immediately jumps out to a lot of people seeing a diagram like this is that there's sort of two groups here, right? There's a dichotomy where all the planets closer to the sun are a lot smaller than the planets that are farther away. And that's not a coincidence. There's a good reason for that. So if we go back 5 billion years to when the solar system was born, um, when all the planets were forming, we started out with the sun in the center here, and then this big disk of material around that. And in that disk, there was dust, gas, uh, things like ga uh, rocks and ices. And over time, all these small little particles in that disk, the ones that were close to each other, would start to clump up and accrete together to form larger and larger things that eventually became the bodies that formed the planets in our solar system. Um, and uh, the materials that were in the disk, uh, what the, how the planets formed, actually depended on where they were in the disk. Because closer into the star, you have different things than farther away. When you're right next to the star, it's so hot that only things like rocks and metals can actually be in a solid form and be incorporated into planets. But farther away, beyond something that we call the ice line, uh, it's cold enough that things like water, carbon dioxide, methane, ammonia, this can actually solidify and become ices, and you actually can get those ices incorporated into the planets that are forming. So, where you form in the disk kind of dictates what the planet is going to end up being made of. Um, and the planets, so they're, they're orbiting the sun as they go around and as they're forming, but they stay at roughly the same distance. This image here in the, in the top, your right, top right here, um, is showing a planet-forming disk around another star. See these, these dark lanes here are kind of where those planets are forming and carving out gaps in the disk. And our solar system would have looked somewhat similar to that billions of years ago, where the planets kind of stayed in their lane as they formed. Because they stayed in their lane, the inner planets, so maybe something like Mars, as it formed, it accreted all of that rocky material that was available to it, and then it kind of stopped growing from there because there was nothing else it could get. So if we took a cross-section of Mars, we'd see in a metal core in the middle and then surrounded by rock. But Jupiter, which is a lot further away, beyond that ice line, which is important here, it got all the rock, it got a lot of icy material too, and then it grew big enough that it could actually um, uh, accrete and retain a big atmosphere full of gases like hydrogen and helium too. So Jupiter and all those outer planets end up being a lot larger than these small planets inside because they're beyond the ice side, because they have access to a lot of material. So in that solar system centric view of planet formation, we have the rocky terrestrial planets forming close to the star and the big gas and ice stars that are far away. There's two types of planets and where they form dictates what they look like. For centuries, those were the only planets we knew of. I mean, we had Pluto too, right? Pluto and the dwarf planets, but those don't fit my narrative, so we can ignore them. Um, so we had those eight planets, and that's all we knew about planet formation. But then, starting about 30 years ago, we started to learn about planets that are outside of our solar system orbiting other stars. We call these exoplanets, um, and as of a few years ago, we passed 5,000 known exoplanets. So, and a lot of these exoplanets are similar to the ones that we know in our own solar system. We have like I said, the is there a pointer? So we have the we have gas giant exoplanets. We have oh sorry, choo choo. <laughs> Like I talked about, terrestrial planets, things like Neptune, but also some that.
51 Pegasus IB is not the correct answer. It's true. Right here. It is C. So it's C, whatever that serial code says there. Um, so this is a, it was a pair of planets orbiting a pulsar discovered in 1992. Um, so a pulsar is sort of an undead star, so now some of these cool travel posters, we can see the planets caught in the horrifying grasp of an undead star. It has a, another name, Link, affectionately called because it's undead. So in 92, um, uh, Alex Volchin and Dale Frail discovered the planets orbiting this star. Alex Volchin, coincidentally, was one of my grad school professors, but decades after he found the planet. Um, and then they also found a third planet in that system just a couple years later. Now, this is really exciting, right? We have these small planets orbiting an undead star that should capture the public attention. It'd be really cool. Maybe you win a Nobel Prize. But the Nobel Committee thought otherwise. They gave the Nobel to 51 Peg B, which was a planet discovered three years later, using a different method. Now, I disagree with that award. I think my professor should have gotten it. Um, but it was kind of justified. I mean, 51 Peg B is similar to Jupiter. The star it orbits is similar to our sun. So similar size to Jupiter, star similar to the sun. Maybe it's more exciting that we have a familiar kind of planet in another system and not just something random that doesn't really tell us more about our own system. But it isn't quite as familiar as that actually. So I'm showing again an orbit diagram for the solar system where this is now at two scale, with all, where all the orbits are relative to the sun. Uh, we can see that we have laser. Saturn out here, Jupiter, the ice cycle between Jupiter and Mars. I'll wait for the train. Choo choo. And we would expect that 51 Pegasi B, a Jupiter like planet, should also form, you know, somewhere beyond the ice line. Somewhere out here. But if we actually look at where it would be on the solar system diagram, it's right there. It's right next to its star. Um, so 51 Peg B is 10 times closer to its star than Mercury is to the sun. It's right next to that host star with an orbital period of just four days. So it goes around the star every four days, less than a single week here. And because it's right next to the star, it gets really hot because of all that incoming radiation, and we call it a hot Jupiter. So this is found in 1995, and we've actually found hundreds of other planets just like this in other systems as well. So we know of hundreds of hot Jupiters that are orbiting their stars. We know of nothing like that in our own solar system. And even ignoring the whole ice line thing and the planet formation thing was a small. This is so unfamiliar because, again, these are the solar system planets. The small ones down here, the big ones up here. These are all way closer to their stars than Mercury is to our sun. We, we know of nothing like this. It's completely unfamiliar. So what's going on here? Uh, we'll start by going back to our solar system. This is what it looks like today, or roughly, you know, not to scale again. Um, but this isn't necessarily what it looked like when it formed. In fact, a lot of the um, most widely accepted theories of planet formation state that these planets did quite a bit of moving around before they decided where they are. So we think it's possible that Uranus and Neptune actually switched places. They actually formed in the inverse direction and then switched later on. Uh, it's possible that Jupiter formed a little bit closer in, moved inwards for a while, and then switched directions and migrated back outwards to where it currently is. So the fact that the planets are thought to have maybe moved can tell us a little bit about, you know, maybe how 51 Peg B and these other hot Jupiters got to where they are. So we're saying that maybe 51 Peg, 51 Peg B, sorry, formed beyond the ice line and then later on migrated inwards to where we see it today. Now how could that have happened? There are a few ways that giant planets like this could migrate. Um, the first is that it forms inside of that disk we talked about earlier, and then before the disk dissipates, the planet migrates inwards within the disk because of forces forces from the gas and the dust that will drag the planet inwards, leaving it as a hot Jupiter before the disk finally disappears. The other possibility is that it formed in that disk, far away beyond the ice line. The disk then disappeared, and some other mechanism caused its eccentricity to get excited, which will then lead, it, lead to it falling inwards to the star. And to elucidate that a little bit, so eccentricity excitation, what I'm talking about is if the planet started on a circular orbit, sort of like the orbit that Earth has around the sun, and then later on, something caused it to be on a not circular orbit. So all planets actually have elliptical orbits, not circles. A circle is just a special type of type of ellipse that's not elongated at all. Um, but there are interactions that can cause these orbits to be elongated. 
So one of these is called the leadoff cosine mechanism, where if there's another star in the system, so the star has a stellar companion, so it's a pair of stars, the planet's orbiting one of them, that other star can actually torque the orbit of the planet and cause its eccentricity to increase and decrease and increase and decrease and increase and decrease and, decrease and keep on doing that until somehow it might get caught in that high eccentricity state, which would then lead it, um, allow it to then become a hot Jupiter. So I'll stay on the next slide. Um, and the other mechanism is planet-planet scattering. So if there's another planet in the system that happens to, at some points, cross paths with the one we're interested in, they can have an interaction that leads to the, the giant planet getting onto an eccentric orbit, and that other planet either being ejected from the system entirely or just being moved to a different part of the orbit. So these are two ways that the eccentricity can get excited. And once that happens, it can then tidally circularize. So in an eccentric orbit, the, um, the planet passes really close to the star on one end. So the star is towards one end of that orbit. And when that happens, there will be tidal interactions. So the same way that the sun and the moon cause tides on Earth, causing our oceans to come in and out, um, there can be tides in the atmosphere of the star, causing it to expand and contract in certain directions, and in the interior of the planet. And when these happen, so when that planet is swimming, swimming close to its star, those tidal forces will steal energy from the orbit. When the orbit loses energy, it has to get smaller. So it'll shrink and shrink, it gets circular, and end up producing a hot Jupiter like we see today. So we have these two possibilities for how these hot Jupiter kinds of planets can form. Um, but we don't really know which one is correct, how, how they actually did form. We know that there are observable predictions we can make. We can say, so if this theory is correct, here's what we might see. So if um, we have that tidal migration mechanism. We don't expect hot Jupiters to have any friends. We don't expect them to have any close planets near to them because those interactions are really dynamic and really um, really energetic, and they would either kick out those other planets or um, cause them to only exist far away from the star and not near that hot Jupiter right next to the star. Whereas with this migration, there's no reason we couldn't have other planets there. They're all just migrating inwards together. Um, on the flip side, with tidal migration, we do expect these warm Jupiters, so the things that are on the way to becoming a hot Jupiter, to have eccentric orbits. So if we see the things that used to be, you know, it started out as a Jupiter like our own, got out to an eccentric orbit, and it's on its way to becoming a hot Jupiter, we might expect to capture a snapshot of it at that phase of its, of its life. Whereas for disk migration, they're all just going to be circular even as they go inwards. So we might see an intermediate product that's a warm Jupiter that's on, the, on its way to becoming a hot Jupiter, which is migrating in with the disk, or that didn't quite make it all the way before that disk disappeared. But the problem is that we don't really have a lot of examples of these warm Jupiters to study. So something that I'm working on, and something that a lot of folks in my field are working on, is finding more warm Jupiters so that we can better figure out which of these mechanisms is actually producing the hot Jupiters that we see today. And answering this question that's been on a lot of astronomers' minds is that discovery of that Nobel Prize winning, maybe not as much deserved, exoplanet. So one of the ways we're doing this is with a uh, space telescope called TESS, or the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. The satellite is scanning the entire sky uh, one sector at a time, so it's pointing in one direction for 30 days, moving to another direction for 30 days, and continuing to do this till it maps the entire sky, as you're seeing in this video. And it finished this first um, sequence of observations that I've shown here in its first two years since it launched in 2018, and over the last four years, and what it's continuing to do now is just to remap all of these and fill in gaps that it hadn't seen before. And as it does that, what it's doing is it's monitoring the brightnesses of all of the stars that it's observing. It's monitoring the brightnesses to look for the sign of a planet that might be crossing in front of that star along our line of sight. So if we see the brightness of the star decrease, that might tell us there's a planet blocking some of the light. That's called a planet transit. So it's transiting exoplanet survey satellite. This is what it's aiming to do. So it's found thousands of planet candidates. But one of the problems with tests is that, or with this method, is that we don't really, we can't really, um, get a lot more information about the orbit aside from what its period is, so the time between the transits, and maybe how big the planet is, so how deep that transit is. We can't get the shape of the the shape of the orbit, which is actually what we need to measure whether it's eccentric or circular, which is the important part for the warm Jupiters, as I said. Um, so when I was a, a young grad student six years ago, um, I was thinking about what kind of science I might want to do for my thesis or just for other projects. And I read a paper by some folks that were talking about exactly this problem. The test is going to find a lot of planets that aren't going to, that are going to be possibly interesting, possibly these kinds of warm Jupiters, but not quite well constrained enough with this data alone. Um, and I was fortunate enough that the team I was working with in grad school had just recently finished building a new instrument 
called Nuit. This is a Bonhoeffer word that means to see. Um, and this instrument had just, was being installed at um, Kid Peak National Observatory here in Arizona. Um, and it was available for people at my university to do size wise. And one of the things that an instrument like Nuit could do is, so it's a spectrograph which, which splits the um, starlight that it gets in into a spectrum with which we can measure the Doppler signature of that light. The Doppler signature can be used to tell the, um, the speed of stars as they're, or as they're orbiting, which tells us the speed of the planets that are going around them. So by looking at stars with this instrument, if we look at a star that has one of these warm Jupiter candidates from tests, we can measure the, uh, the speed of that orbit and figure out what kind of what the shape of the orbit looks like. So this is something that I've been doing for the past five years or so. I've been looking at stars that, are, that have these warm Jupiter candidates trying to measure their orbits to figure out which of these possible mi migration paths they could be associated with. Um, so what I'm showing here is this is what, in, in the ways that we measure these signals, we're measuring what we call the radial velocity. And the shape of the signal would look like this for a circular orbit, just a sinusoid. And then as the orbit gets more eccentric, it'll start to look something like this. So with higher eccentricities, we get these sharper peaks, because the planet moves really, really fast as it gets really close to the star, and slower as it gets far away. So we see these different shaped orbits when the planet has a different um, distances to the star as it goes around. And then also the shape can change a little bit too depending on the orientation along our line of sight. So this is a, a little zoo of the possible signals we could be observing. Um, and I'm just gonna point out a few here. So we have this one, thing, this one, and this one. And these are a few that we found within the first few years of our survey um, of looking at these planets. So we found one warm Jupiter with an eccentricity of 0.75, which is pretty highly eccentric. I'm sorry, that's my puppy. He's not even sold. He's adorable, but it's loud. Um, we found that one that's probably circular, and one that's actually really, 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 really eccentric, which I can't talk about today because it's under a press embargo. Um, but we found some of these orbits, so I'm showing them again here, these really cool some eccentric ones, one's circular, and then some of my colleagues that are doing similar work also found some of these pretty eccentric orbits in some circular. Now the ratio here might suggest that, hey, the tidal migration mechanism is more important than the disk migration mechanism because we're seeing more of these eccentric planets than circular ones. But unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, some other folks that are doing similar kinds of projects are looking at hot Jupiters in a little bit more depth, and finding that some of them actually have lots of friends. So as I said, hot Jupiters with friends means we're looking at disk migrations. If you wouldn't expect those nearby planets to the hot Jupiters if they are going through these highly dynamic processes with the highest interest in migration. So what type of migration would channel is more prominent? Well, all of these boxes get checked. So we see everything that applies to both. So it's kind of suggests that maybe there's a mixture of the two contributing to what we see as the hot Jupiter population today. Um, and all I'll say to people that may have a little power in my field is give me more telescope time so I can look at more things and figure it out a bit better. Um, but no, honestly, like the more of these that we find, uh, and we're already seeing and starting to see this today, is we can start to look at what sorts of properties the planets that fall into one bucket or the other have in common and figure out whether these other properties might map to how we produce hot Jupiters like 51 Peg B, which I'll have no real prize. Um, yeah, so that's all I've got for you today. I'll take questions, and whoever got that trivia question correct, don't forget to get your prize from merch. Yeah, so that's a question, and I'll repeat the question for you guys. Uh, this person was asking whether our sample that we're observing is limited to only planets that actually have their orbits oriented edge onto our line of sight, right? Because with the transit method, we can't see transits for planets that don't pass in front of their star if they're oriented differently. And that's exactly right. We can only observe stars that have this very specific inclination to our line of sight. There are, we can blindly search stars, because with the, with the other method I was using to measure the shapes of the orbits, we don't need them to be transiting. So we can do that, we just wouldn't know that there's a planet there to look at, so we'd have to look at a larger stellar sample to find them. Yeah. Yes? So is there any correlation between the, these extension orbits and the class of stars that they're orbiting? 
That's a great question. So this question is whether there's a correlation between the whether they're eccentric or circular orbits and the type of star that they're orbiting. So um, I don't know the answer to that. I know this is something that people have looked at before, but I haven't specifically, so I can't tell the answer yet. Yeah. Questions back there. another good question, and it's a very interesting question that lots of people are working on in astronomy. So they're asking, and I'll, I'll go back to it actually, um, it's many slides back, but we'll get to it. This one here. So the question was, we have this big cluster of planets down here, this cluster of planets up here, and same thing here and here, and nothing in between. And this is something called the, the radius gap, or the Neptune desert, um, where in astronomy we see lots of big planets and lots of small planets, but the ones that are really close in and in between don't exist. And again, there's debates as to what's causing this. One of them is that when you're really close to the star like this, if you don't have enough of an atmosphere, so if you have somewhat of an atmosphere but not a huge one, it can get all stripped away by the star. So you're left with that rocky core. So you either have the rocky core ones or ones that are really big that can't get stripped away by the star. There's other theories for that too that I am not as familiar with, so don't quote me on this being the correct answer, but that's possible. So the question is whether when I observe, I target specific things or sort of look at a broader sample and narrow it down, is that? Uh, we're just talking about your like, schedule. Do you try to get time specifically for like a specific set of planets? Yeah, well, yeah, so. Is that around when you get time? Sure, so how I schedule is, uh, the instrument I use, Newid, which I talked about, is actually on a queue-based schedule. So it's almost always on the instrument and it can just observe whenever, depending on when things trigger. So. So yeah, I choose planets based on what are interesting, and then I try to get the time when I can get time. Yeah. All right, I was told that was the last question, so I'm gonna hand it back to Logan. You're a great audience, thank you. It is almost 8 o'clock, so let's just call it 8 o'clock and say we'll be back at 8.20. Please grab another beer. Don't forget to check out our merch table. Don't forget to tip your bartenders. And uh, we'll see you back in 20 minutes. Bye. This is like just regular Every audience? Or like, wow. Um, we this, bring everyone together. I mean, a lot of these people are, are astronomers in some way, too, before. Wow. I would say maybe half are astronomers. Hi, Hi. Hi. Hello. Hello. How are you today? This is cool. <laughs>
clear, very, very um, important. And this is uh, in kind of underpinning the currently uh, most widely accepted uh, cosmology or understanding of our universe called Lambda CDM, uh, in which our universe is made up a little bit of ordinary matter that makes up us and the Earth and the Sun, and then most of it, most of it, is this stuff that we call dark something that well it's there but we don't know what it is. Dark matter, and then dark energy. Dark dark matter is the CDM in that cold dark matter, and then the lambda is for Einstein what he called his greatest blunder, the cosmological constant which causes expansion, or it represents expansion of our universe. He actually wasn't wrong. Although, I mean, he probably was wrong, but then it was right. I don't know. Uh, again, we have no clue really about any of this. But <laughs> understanding dark energy is very important um, to understand uh, how our universe formed, how it evolved to its current state, and then what might, what might happen to us uh, in the future. You, know, you may have heard phrases like big rip, or big crunch, or big freeze, and you know, the fate of the universe. Um, and dark energy will play a big role in which of those actually comes to pass. So that's where our new story uh, comes into play. A huge, huge breaking headline uh, in cosmology just a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, something like that. Um, and this comes hot off of Kit Peak. So, you know, now we're that way. Um, or that way? Uh, I kind of worked there, so I should know. Um, so uh, an instrument up on Kip Peak at the 4 meter male telescope, DESI, the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument, pretty good, um, released their first uh, set of data and analysis um, looking at uh, hundreds of thousands of distant galaxies to look for evidence of our universe's expansionary history. And so to do this, what they do is they take a lot of observations of galaxies uh, to make a three-dimensional map. So see where the galaxies are in the sky, and then also um, see how far away they are. And so what are they looking for? They're looking for hints of something called baryonic acoustic oscillations. Um, not as scary as you might think. Um, but what you can think of is the universe starts as some kind of hot soup of plasma. Uh, and in this hot plasma soup, you can have pressure waves. Think of maybe dropping a stone in a puddle and then it ripples. And so these ripples can travel along until... Phone home. 
Okay, if you are an astronomy enthusiast, you are probably familiar with the two direct images of nearby supermassive black holes taken by the Event Horizon Telescope, um, the EHT. The EHT is a network or an interferometer uh, of radio telescopes with detectors scattered all over the globe um, from the South Pole to Arizona. Um, by creating long baselines, uh, which is just the distance between any two of those radio telescopes. Um, when I was an undergrad, I also did this comedy routine, and it was called Whose Baseline Is It Anyway? Because I thought that was really funny, so uh, thank you. Um, so anyway, by creating wide separations between telescopes, you can achieve ultra-high resolution to resolve extremely small distant objects. So you can imagine um, basically just making a gigantic aperture. Um, the, the biggest camera that you could possibly think of is the size of the Earth. Um, by placing two telescopes that far apart. Um, so that is how you resolve something this super tiny. Um, the metaphor that the PR people like to use is the following. Um, being able to resolve the ring around the Sagittarius A star in the middle of the Milky Way is like if you were standing in the middle of New York City um, and you were to read a newspaper that was sitting on a table in Paris. Um, just normal metaphor stuff, just like stuff that you think about all the time. Like I really wish I could read a newspaper um, very far away. But that is kind of cool to think about. Um, if you like ignore the curvature of the Earth and so on, um, that, that's, that resolution is really crazy. Okay, so new images coming from the EHT now focus on the polarized light observations, um, which are typically used to study magnetic field vectors. Light is an electromagnetic wave, um, and it oscillates. When that oscillation occurs in a preferred direction, we refer to that as polarized light. This is often caused by some external force um, like a magnetic field that is acting upon moving particles. Um, and human eyeballs can't detect polarization, but you can tune a radio telescope to see it. Um, so we have now directly imaged the direction and the structure of the magnetic fields that are flying around Sagittarius A star and the black hole in the center of M87. Um, so not only are we seeing the ring around the black hole, but we are also literally the, the like swooshy things. Those are real observations um, of the direction of the polarized light. So you can see that the magnetic field is kind of, um, you know, in this like clockwise direction. Um, so magnetic fields as a whole are a topic avoided by most astronomers. Um, I feel like Danny and I do this talk about all the time. We're like, here's a thing that we don't know about. Um, and it's not just like us. It's not like we personally hate these things. It's like if someone says magnetic field in a talk to the pool, I don't know what that is. Um, but like there's like five people in the world that care about it. And um, <laughs> okay, well, Danny knows more about them than I do. Okay, but here is a direct quote from Project co-lead Angelo Ricarte, who says, by imaging polarized light from hot glowing gas near black holes, we are directly inferring the structure and strength of the magnetic fields that thread the flow of gas and matter that the black hole feeds on and ejects. Um, so the ejecta thing is kind of cool. A particular field of interest for the EHT is to directly image the magnetic fields that are induced by black hole jets, um, which are high energy shooting material that are often best seen in the x-ray or in the radio um, or in polarized radio uh, observations. Um, Understanding the magnetic field structure along the direction of motion offers crucial physical insight into how the jets form um, and how they actually interact with the surrounding like empty vacuum um, and the gas that is uh, just kind of in the empty space between stars. Um, so this is a really incredible image. I feel like you probably see this orange donut all the time and you're like, is this new? But um, the swooshy things are the first image of a black hole magnetic field. So that is that on that. Um, and now we will turn it back over to Logan, um, and we'll have our second speaker. So thank you for listening. Thanks. Thank you. 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 Thank
fans waiting, and uh, let's give you welcome. Literally just working. It was literally just working. You all heard me. What the heck? I blame PowerPoint. Well, that, that's working now. Holy sweet. Uh uh. Do you like my voice? <laughs> Woo! I'm no good singer. But I will do my best. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you, Logan. No, I didn't uh, thank you, everyone. What a beautiful evening. And uh, it is amazing. You are still here at 8.30. Uh, your home, your family may wait for you, but I appreciate you are still here. As a kind human being, we always think we see each other as we are. Do we? No. Tom, thankfully uh, controlling all the techniques I mean today, about three meters away from me, he sees me always about 10 nanoseconds younger as I was. Back there, Eden, invite me, thank you. Further away, you see me about 100 nanoseconds younger you see me, younger version of me. That's why maybe home, when I ask a favor to my wife, lovely wife, Hyeong, can I buy a PlayStation 5? I try to stay further away, so she sees me, younger version of me. A little bit more attractive, right? Right now, we have a moon, but daytime, if you go outside, look at the sun. It takes about eight minutes. At the speed of light, it takes eight <coughs> minutes from the sun all the way to the earth. And our beautiful camera, usually two of us, we have other cameras. So we see the sun as it was, never as it is. And this is absolutely fascinating concept because extreme version of it. This is what the amazing James Webb Space Telescope took and gave to us as a gift, spending 12.5 hours of exposure. It is taking a photo of something about 13 billion light years away from us. So we are looking at the universe as it was 13 billion years ago. This is, if you believe in the Big Bang Theory, we are looking at pretty much the baby of the universe. Now, in order to do this, we absolutely have a uh, great technology we have to enable taking photo of such a thing. Such a far away stuff, what does it mean? Well, if I'm moving away, I'm getting younger to you, but also I'm getting smaller and I am getting dimmer. So that is exactly why we want to build a big telescope so you can collect more photon energy so you see something dimmer but at the same time you can reserve smaller things so you can see how they look like although you are far away so james webb was using six and a half meters in diameter primary mirror using 18 hexagonal segments together it is six and a half meters so large people couldn't fit in a rocket so they have to fold it, launch, and unfold it. And right now, many people here enjoying the outcome from the James Webb Space Telescope. It's gonna do a great job for the astronomy community. But person like me doing optical science, this is already a past. So I wanna talk about what is coming, what is next big thing. So. March 14th, the Pi Day, the rocket 
in this case, Starship by SpaceX was launched. Pi Day 3.14. It didn't land as we wanted, but at least it went to the orbit and it was flying. What this means, this is happening. This will absolutely fly this year, 2024. What does it mean? How many of you know how large this is actually? Everything looked big on screen, isn't it? Actually, this starship, for instance, is large enough. So the James Webb Space Telescope, six and a half meter in diameter primary, will just fit without folding. So now we have a rocket. We don't have to fold James Webb Space Telescope anymore. It will just fit as a single piece. All right, let's combine it with Arizona Spirit. At your way, if you visit football stadium, I love our team. Uh, I have a mixed feeling, but I love our football team. Under the football stadium, we also have a beautiful mirror lab where we are making world large topic. Actually, one of them you see in this video, 8.4 meters in diameter, is the largest optic ever made by mankind, period. And we have been known as the ground telescope manufacturer. Why? Because these meters has been so big. Not anymore. You just saw giant rocket now can fit these meters in the rocket. So as long as now we can design a telescope that big but fit in this new launch vehicles, giving us giant space, it's like we have an infinitely large Amazon delivery car, so <laughs> you can order whatever you want. So let's get to that. This is the James Webb Space Telescope design. Oh, what a lovely design, right? This is six and a half meters in diameter primary, segmented, 18 beautiful pieces, fantastic performance, of course. Secondary here, third theory, we call it TMA, three meter and eighth met. Very good field of view performance. M4, beam is coming. This is the telescope focal point, focal plane. It's a little bit too long. We want to make it more compact to fit. Well, nothing is new. Inspiration comes from what you see. When I was a little kid at the Mirror Lab, and here Mike, I see Mike, we were great friends at the Mirror Lab. I was lucky to work on some incredible projects. This is one of them. Here you see a very interesting optic. It's 8.4 meters in diameter. Outside is M1. Inside is M3, so primary 30 meter on a single substrate. How about that? This is actually only one hybrid optic, and I worked on it. It was lovely, M1 and M3 on a single substrate. And here is the design, and some of you may recognize this one. This is the Vera C. Rubin Observatory LSST. This will be the next big eye doing a survey and this year, we just heard the news, the mirror manufactured at the mirror lab under the football stadium, U Arizona, has been mounted on the telescope. So this big thing is also coming. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> so Arizona is doing great all together, but let's think about it. This gave me some idea, huh? M1 and M3 is co-located. Cool and there's a good design, fantastic design, giving you a wide field of view. So, let's mix them. So is this James Webb or LSST? Maybe it's somewhere in between. M1, M2, M3 right here, right next to M1. M4, that is where the telescope focal plane is. So, by having this now, we are actually thinking about Maybe your web metal lab will be a space agency in the future, right? Again, this whole thing is changing the game. And when you look at the optical performance of that telescope I just showed you, this circle represents the diffraction-limited areas, meaning 
Maxwell's equation says you cannot make it better than that focused spot. And the geometrical ray tracing, the blue dots spot diagram, are even smaller than the theoretical limit. We call this thing diffraction limited performance. So the telescope design is here, and who knows? Maybe in near future, you may hear some news. Your way, Mirror Lab is now working on space systems. So that is a one potential, but that's not. I have three stories today. Well, more giants. Can you do more? Not just one. We are always greedy. So can I get five PlayStation 5s, for instance, like that? Well, let's make a thin, compact eye. So now you are looking at a very interesting design, mixing a holographic side and refractive side. One side, front, is refractive. It's Fresnel, like lighthouse, but it's mostly refraction. Back side of it is rainbow, as you see here. It is holographic element. The beauty of this kind of special lens is not only thin, the refraction creates a rainbow in one direction, hologram creates rainbow in the other direction. In astronomy, sometimes you don't like rainbow unless you do spectroscopy. So what this means in this lens, by having those two surfaces creating rainbow in opposite direction, you are canceling it, meaning you have no chromatic aberration. So very good lens solution without chromatic aberration. Well, small enough chromatic aberration, more strictly speaking. And you make them as a segment because you may not make them all at once. As a matter of fact, we want to make many of them. So what if we can do a stamping, molding? So the idea is segment them in this way. And if you make a mold for one segment, and you just stamp many of them equal to have all the other segments. We did some simulations, as you see here, we did some molding simulation because this is not a glass molding. We are not talking about, this is not a plastic molding. So we are not talking about plastic lens. This is a glass holographic lens molding. And we spent more than two years to master this technique, the team, and we finally made it. So this is the very first one of its kind at this scale, which is about the size of my palm, my hands, and it took more than two years. And I must say, I thank the Moore Foundation who found, uh, funded this effort for years. So finally, this became real. And what we may do, because now we may replicate it, if you can replicate many of them at a bigger scale, so right now we are working on bigger version of it, not the size of my hands, but bigger version, then you may make that lens, let's say, 8 meters in diameter, bigger than Jake's Webb Space Telescope. And you make many of them. Why? This is a molding. You are not making one by one. You are just stamping it. So you make many of them, put them in a very compact package, launch, on orbit, you deploy. And today, the first speaker talked about beautiful way of looking at the exoplanet. In this way, you can look at the exoplanet and look at the spectroscopy of it. And by having so many of them, we are talking about not one, not two, not three, but more than 100 and thousands of Earth-like planets in order to have statistically meaningful scientific discovery about the exoplanet out there. And the last one. So you're almost done and you may enjoy beer. I hope train goes by so I may drink a beer. Maybe that will be my first time ever drink a beer during my technical talk. But the universe is not kind to me tonight. But, bigger giant, the last one. Let's see. 
So this is another concept we are working on. Space terahertz telescope. This is OASIS. What you see on the left side is the primary mirror. It is 20 meters in diameter. This is far bigger than even James Webb. James Webb is only like a small, tiny, cute area in the middle of it. This is not going to fit in the big rocket. It doesn't. So what are we going to do? Well, in this case, the solution is, what if we make it as an inflatable mirror, balloon? So you store them, launch, you go up there, the quiet and cozy place, and you deploy the boom, and you inflate the primary mirror. So uh, you can have a big birthday party up there, right? Happy birthday. And it is actually just like the party balloon you can buy at Fry's or Safeco, right? Here is the design. So you may thought, how come a balloon can be a mirror? Well, let's take a look. This side is the balloon. Half of it is transparent. The other half is reflective. So the light from far away object goes through the transparent part, which is canopy, and see the concave reflective side of the balloon and then it focused the beam. And right here, we have a nice series of mirror in order to correct the aberrations so that you can have a good field of view, still very nice imaging quality. This is not inflatable, but this giant one is the inflatable optic so that you can get unbelievable light collecting power and resolution. Because no one was doing this kind of crazy thing in order to image something. There was similar thing for radio communication, by the way. So this is not the first balloon in uh, orbit. There were a few for communication, like radio antenna. But now we want to use it for mirror to image something. We just made one in order to demonstrate it. So here is a one meter version of the inflatable balloon and you just saw we were inflating it. We thought it's pretty good, but we have to test it, right? Unless you test it, you never know what you are doing. You must know how to test it. So here, the inspiration is coming from Scooby-Doo. So what is the inspiration this time? If you mirrors. watch hey, this look, episode like in Scooby Doo, star. Can you look like a chihuahua? Oh, I love dog. <laughs> Such a lovely creature on Mars. If there is a dog on Mars, I gotta go to Mars. <laughs> now, as you see this, if you know how your dog look like, got a bunch of and if you mirrors. see this image, hey, look, I look of like course a the star. information is there. Can you look like a chihuahua? And as a good scientist, you can figure out what the shape of the unknown mirror. And that's exactly what we need in this case. We want to know what is the shape of the unknown got a bunch of those inflated mirror. Hey, look. I look like so we are doing a little bit different. Um, instead of Scooby-Doo, we are using iPad. So this iPad, instead of displaying Scooby-Doo, again, we are boring scientists. So we are putting a sinusoidal pattern, black and white, black and white. That's okay. As long as you know what you are displaying, you're fine. That is the, the Scooby-Doo. And you need an eye to look at how it looks like. Here is a camera below. And now you may wonder, where is your balloon? This side, right here. You are looking at a dummy representing a window we are going to put the balloon because we actually have to put it in a space-like environment because that is the name of the game. This is a balloon not in your home for a, a birthday party. 
but we have to send it to the organ. So, here is a T-back chamber. We went to Northrop Grumman in this case. So we put that one meter balloon inside T-back chamber. So it's a quiet, dark, very cold, and vacuum space. And then you close the chamber, and there is a window, the dummy window, in this case, real one, and the iPad Pro and camera is looking at the mirror as we are doing space-like environment tests. Getting cold, and there was an artificial sun heating up the mirror so that we see if the mirror changed the shape as we are heating up one side, as if when you are doing your s'mores at a campsite, oh, front side is warm because you have a nice fire, you're doing s'mores, the other side is cold. And then, because of the thermal expansion, your body will be distorted. We want to measure that and make sure this mirror up there does not distort too much. And that was the name of the mission. So, we made a measurement, and right now you, you are looking at the change from one point of a time to next to next. Meaning, even though we are heating up, it is not really changing much. Ideally, we want to see all zero here. Doesn't change at all. Yes, it does change, meaning we are making realistic measurement. But if you look at the scale here, they are only plus minus few microns. And this terahertz telescope, depending on the wavelengths, sometimes 30 micron, 60 micron, 80 micron, and longer wavelengths. This is nothing compared to the wavelengths we are trying to measure. So this was a great. And the final question, when we worked on it, James Webb Space Telescope successfully launched and whole world was talking about it and very soon there was a breaking news. There was a space accident, right? Some of you may remember. Micrometeorite hit one of the segments. Oh, space is not a friendly space. There are many things flying at high speed. So right now you are looking at the wavefront measurement data using near cam. Near cam is Marsha Ricky at UOA. She is the PI of the near cam instrument behind James Webb. What a beautiful team. And using the wavefront sensor, you can see, oh, there is now a hop, bump. So we know this is happening. And many of you and my friends, wow, they will, your balloon is now doomed, right? <laughs> because Wow, that's scary. Well, let's check what can happen. I know no matter how many equations I'm going to show you, you're not going to believe me. Just like my wife doesn't believe me if I just talk. I have to prove. So here it goes. We bought a needle. The team, my team, went to the North Grumman, spent a good time, had a good uh, Korean style of chickens, and it was good and scientific mission. <laughs> and we went to a place with, where we can buy a needle, like Joanne, right? You go to Joanne, we bought a needle. Why? Because we were mounted inside a tea bag chamber, and last day of the test campaign, we engaged the needle so that it can create a puncture behind the balloon. We destroyed it twice. And we measured it after the experiment using microscope. That's what you see here. So we, we punctured it in a very terrible way. Oh, as a record, by the way, uh, this needle is in my office now. <laughs> it's going to make me rich one day. <laughs> Hopefully, it may go to a uh, space museum. Because that is the, as long as I know, only TRL-9 needle, I think, or TRL-6. If you are a NASA person, you know technical readiness rebel. So this needle has been inside the T-Deck chamber, and we tested it. Anyway, so here is a quick question. 
What happens if you pop a balloon in space? Some of you already know the answer because I talked about this at class. So if you already heard about it, it doesn't count, all right? I know who you are. So anyone, any idea? Number one, burst instantly. Two, rapidly deflates. Three, extremely slowly deflates. Number four, nothing happens. Yes, I see hands up there. Nothing happens. Number, what, what number? Number three. Extremely slowly deflates, and you got it. <laughs> of course, I thought no one gonna pick one and two because that means they doesn't exist here, right? <laughs> it's really between number three and four. Again, no matter how many equations I show you, you are not gonna trust me. So let me just show you. This is the image of that Scoopy-Doo. You remember that lovely dog? This is it is. So imagine this pattern is the dog we are looking at. As you saw, this is a unprocessed video. No processing at all. And you just saw something happened. And right now, this is a video. It's not a photo. Meaning, nothing is happening. Why is that? Why is that? Because if you think about it, inflating a balloon is all about pressure difference. The delta pressure between inside and outside of the balloon. On orbit, outside is vacuum. So inside, you don't need much gas molecules. Just a little bit is more than enough. So there are nothing many to escape actually. This 20 meters in diameter balloon, I'm here as a gas molecule. There's a small hole there. Oh, there are not many uh, going through that hole. Second, we are cold, meaning I am lazy. So I'm not gonna go there and escape. So it is very unlikely it will deflate fast. As a matter of fact, as you just saw in this experiment, it doesn't deflate at all, actually. Yes, if you wait long enough, it will deflate. But what you do? Just like scuba diving, you bring some gas tank, and you slowly feed gas as much as you are losing, and this balloon will be inflated forever. The very final photo is another version. We never stop. As we confirm, wow, this is so promising technology, the scientist said, can we make it even better? Even better meaning shorter wavelengths, something down to 30 micron. How about that? This is just above what James Webb can do. At that level, you have to make sure in your beam pass, nothing is heating up. Because if anything heating up, that itself becomes the noise because the black body radiation from that. So in this design, you are looking at off-axis, unobscured, 14 meters in diameter design, where you have nothing blocking the beam, and everything else is behind the sun shield. So that you can do 30 micron and above observations. And this concept is now known as CERTUS. Finally, I want to say this is nothing about myself. Today I had a fun standing here, uh, no chance to drink beer, but it was really fun. However, there are so many people working on this project together. I am just one of us. Here is a photo of my group members, my good friends, but even there are so many other professors, other incredible researchers, scientists, amazing engineers. So many of us are working together. And uh, today it was my pleasure to talk about this here. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Any questions? Anyone? So what about the weight? So first of all, yes, absolutely, we always want to make things as light as possible. But actually, that name of the game is also rapidly changing. Actually, these rockets are so powerful, so powerful, so that actually weight is much less important than before, unbelievably. Of course, you are launching 8 meters in diameter solid chunk which could be about 200 or 300 tons by itself. Yes, that's a lot. But even the mirror you saw today at the mirror lab, it's a honeycomb lightweight mirror, meaning about 20 tons. Absolutely fine. So these rockets are incredibly powerful. So now with this, what we want to do, we really have to think about it. And these rockets is not one time. It goes up there maybe every other week, every week. Do we have enough telescope manufacturing technology to follow up? This is all very exciting questions. How we can really utilize all these new capabilities, enabling new stuff. Thank you, Logan. That was a great question. Yes. Right, so uh, there are very interesting uh, competing concepts here. You may send many and assemble up there so that you can have a giant collecting aperture. Sometimes that's great. What's downside of it? Well, first of all, if you want to do a coherent imaging, meaning getting you not only photon collection, but also resolving power, resolution, you have to co-phase them. That's not easy. Co-phase many of them is not easy. Also, if you have, let's say, 10 separate telescopes, that means you need a 10 all these subsystems, controlling motion, detector, electronics, uh, communications, right? They also scale together. Having one giant, you need a one communication, maybe back up a little bit more, and then one focal plane, all those things. But what's the challenge? Well, maybe one giant one, it doesn't fit, unless you do balloon. But balloon is not an easy thing also. If you want to do a balloon for visible wavelengths, for instance, still it can be very challenging. So there are two different ways with pros and cons, and depending on what you want to do, one will be a better solution than the other, as always. Thank you, that was a great question. Thank you. One more question. Yes. What is the wavelength of the other? Oh, right. So multiple ones you saw today, like Nautilus, uh, that is the name of the project. That one is now designed for visible wavelengths. So it is absolutely visible with more difficult optical system. The far infrared version, Sirtus or Oasis is either 30 or 80, 90 micron. So that is the difference. And um, we are trying to cover all different kinds of wavelengths, uh, basically. Thank you. One, one last question, yes. So, as I said, the Nautilus has one side holographic or diffractive, the other side refractive. 
So by actually balancing those two things just right, meaning one rainbow, the other rainbow together, just right mix of them, you can already have a very good achromatic system. But when we do a spectroscopy, for instance, actually we may take some advantage of it by adding some holographic pattern so that you're not actually creating a single point, you want a lateral color, meaning rainbow at your focal plane. So that is, I mean, one potential multifunctional lens design we may take advantage of it. So depending on what you want, again, if you want spectroscopy, maybe that chromatic aberration, but in lateral direction, is exactly what you want. Thank you. Once again, enjoy the rest of the evening and with good beer. on Space Drafts 97. Uh, we will be back here, as always, on the third Tuesday. So that is uh, May 21st. Uh, so we'll be back here um, at 7.30. Um, stand by for our speakers for that show. Um, if you haven't joined our mailing list, that's the best way to keep in touch with, with uh, all the events that we're putting on. Um, and uh, don't forget to stop by the merch table. Don't forget to tip your bartenders. And see you back here on May 21st. Yeah, thank you. So I met you. Yeah, now Jim I know you. Yeah. You are at MM, M MMT, right? I'm at the MMT, yeah. Yeah, that's what. Grant and I are working. Oh, oh, this guy, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking. I, that's right. I was like, yeah. I think I know him before, but I was like, ah. Grant and yeah. I are now working together. Uh, oh, okay. Now some polarimeter for uh, GMT. Oh, All right. You want to get to Worst case scenario, we're going to be here. That's why, because I know I'm going to I know I'm going to And then what is it? And then was the one. Yeah, yeah. He's not here. Oh, okay. No, I've been shaming brands for trying to come to this for like a year. Well, I see. Oh, yeah, I see. Thank Hey, uh, not yet. Uh, let me do that just now. I figured out the opacity thing. I want your opinion on this. I know. Well, what is the